Welcome back to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Our mission is to share what we have learned from our experience and the experience of others to help you make more money investing like a pro. We want to teach you how to create wealth by investing in real estate the Discount Property Investor way. To jumpstart your real estate investing career, visit FreeWholesaleCourse.com, the most complete free course on wholesaling real estate ever. Thanks for tuning in. All right, guys, welcome back to the Discount Property Investor Podcast. Your host, Mike Slane, joined the co-host, David Dodge. David, hey guys, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great, Mike. Good thanks for, uh, for thanks for joining me today, man. I Absolutely. feel like I don't see you every time. Well, you know, shows. this whole quarantine, we're all locked down, so that's know, right. That's we right. Start getting in in the studio more often uh, instead of doing everything remote, uh, like we have to sometimes when we have guests from around the around the country, kind of like today. So today we've got a great guest on. Uh, we've got uh, Jimmy Murray. That's right. He's out of Rhode Island. Jimmy is with the Lion Property Management Group. And Jimmy is an expert at property management, but he's also very, very versed in wholesaling, rehabbing, fix and flip, rental properties, and the Burr strategy. So all the things that we align with, guys. We know here at the Discount Property Investor Podcast that we make our money when we buy a deal and we get paid when we sell a deal. So it all comes down to buying right. Hence the name, Discount Property Investor, buying everything at a discount. So let's welcome our guest today, Mr. Jimmy Murray. Jimmy, how you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me, fellas. I, I appreciate that intro. And you hit the nail on the head. Um, early on in my investing career, someone told me, hey, listen, you make all your money on the buy. So negotiate tough up front to provide that protection down the road when you sell. You think we can get this camera farther away? Farther away? Yeah, I'm just joking. <laughs> 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 so Jimmy, we're, uh, you're out of Rhode Island, right? Correct. And uh, let's talk a little bit about your property management company that you got up there. How many, how many uh, properties are you guys managing at, at this point in time? Yep. So we're right around 600 doors. We work with 78 local investors. Well, I would say about half of the investors we work with are local and the rest are around the globe. So whether it's across the country, um, at one point we had a client in Germany, we've got a client out in China. So um, very diverse client base, but uh, really they find value in the same things that we do as an investor. So I think that's really important. Um, when folks listening, if you get to the point that you want to work with a property manager, make sure that you share a similar investment philosophy and that's where you're going to have a higher level of success. Okay. Very cool. So you said 600 doors already? Correct. That's awesome. That's awesome. And you guys got clients local as well as um, international, it sounds like, which is, which is very cool. So let's talk a little bit about the Rhode Island market. I know nothing about that market at all is it a good market for rental properties yeah so i have a close i have a close friend that uh he jokes that rhode island's always the first one into recession and the last one out <laughs> um so there's always a way to find that discounted property um right now we're getting a ton of traffic with investors coming down from boston because the cap rates are so suppressed in boston that folks are migrating south to find that higher cap rate but it it's actually causing properties to clear at a cap rate that local investors uh, shouldn't be purchasing a property at. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about that. What kind of cap rates are your customers experiencing? Like, let's talk about the hypothetical Boston customer, right? What kind of cap rates are they experiencing in Boston? And what kind of cap rates are they getting, you know, with you guys down in Rhode Island that would, you know, incentivize them to come to Rhode Island versus to stay in Boston? Absolutely. So sometimes in Boston, they're actually experiencing negative cap rates. They're, they're banking on that capital appreciation for the money that continues to flow in. Um, but I would say wow, from what I've- mind boggling. I know. Why would anybody do that? <laughs> we, we, I'm with we, you. Yeah. One of our whole strategies is invest for cash flow. The appreciation is just the icing, if it even happens. If it even happens. Jeez. Right. So there's a lot of international money and development dollars coming into that market where it's more uh, speculative investments that are being made. Now, in the Rhode Island market, I would say from A neighborhoods that were typically traded a six cap to D neighborhoods that should trade 12 to 15% cap rate, 
those are probably trading at you know 45 percent less than where they should so if you get investors a hot market is uh pawtucket rhode island i try to correct my rhode island accent so i can pronounce that correctly if anybody <laughs> wanted to google it um we call it pawtucket so if you go into pawtucket uh, i would say you should typically buy at a 10 to 12 percent cap rate those deals are clearing at a six to seven percent cap rate so, so basically if you can provide a positive cap rate you are going to be offering a better return than somebody in Boston, typically. Which is crazy. Which, which is, is crazy. Which is crazy. But you're doing better than that. You're not just providing a positive return. You're, you're giving them, you know, returns six to eight percent. It sounds like. Absolutely. And yeah. We, so it, it, are we primarily single family doors then? That's a great or question. Are, we, are, are you we managing talking? both? Yeah. yeah. So I'm managing both. I would say ninety-seven percent is going to be multifamily doors. So it's okay. anywhere from a three-unit to a six-unit building. So Rhode Island really. Uh, developed our multifamily housing inventory during the Industrial Revolution. So they built all the multifamily houses near the mills that were along the Blackstone River. So people would be able to walk back and forth to work. So it's really that three to six unit inventory. So it's all houses that were built between 1880 to like 1920. Now there are other areas where there are larger complexes where families have come in and they've built monster uh, 80 to 100 unit deals. Um, but that's really like family money. You're not going to see the syndication trading like you see in the Southeast market or even in the Midwest um, with the newer inventory. So a lot of the multifamily product that we work with is a lot older, um, which would cause you, you got to really focus on your CapEx numbers when you get in to buy that property. Right, right. Because you may have to go in and redo a lot of things that are going to be be very expensive. You're wow. just falling apart. Yeah. Old, old buildings. 150 yeah. in some cases. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when you pick up, like I have a, I have a building that was built in 1880 um, in Lincoln, Rhode Island. And uh, I always advertise it as historically charming, right? So really old and it looks nice, but the clawfoot tub's a little beat up in the bathroom. Got it. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's interesting. Well, you got a quite a big, uh, a, quite a lot of units under rental or under management, I should say. Let's talk a little bit about your team, Jimmy. I'm curious to, to hear about you know, how many people you got working with you and for you. Uh, 600 units is quite a lot of units. That sounds like quite a lot of headaches. How many? It's all, yeah, so it's all about having the right processes in place, right? Mm -hmm. So I'll start. I think it's, the business is really split into two segments. So one is the, the maintenance segment and the other is the management segment. So I run the management segment. So that's more interaction with owners and, and tenants day to day related to leasing and rent payments. And then my partner, Chris, he's going to run the maintenance side of the business where I, I think that's the most important piece, because if you're going to go to market and you're going to look to get, you know, at market or above market rents to drive the returns for investors, we got to make sure that we take care of our tenants um, at the right level. I'm not saying that you go in and gut every single unit and put in granite countertops and stainless steel appliances, but you got to make sure when they have that maintenance request, we take care of them so that we can get that longer tenancy. And hopefully when that tenant goes to look for another unit, we upgrade them within the portfolio. Maybe they earn more money where they want something nicer. Nice. So great. I like that. The way that our team is broken out on the, on the maintenance side of the business, we have five full-time maintenance technicians. Um, three of those folks are going to be focused on turning over units. Um, the other two folks are going to be focused on, I call it dink and dunk. So that's the, my, my faucet leaks. I've got a light out. This doesn't work. Um, those guys are going to be um, more seasoned and more experienced. So we can address those onesie twosie issues that tenants have. Um, we also yeah. have a maintenance. So Go five ahead. maintenance guys, three for turnovers, two for, for, you know, day to day stuff. And then a maintenance coordinator. So the maintenance coordinator is going to be that in between tenants and scheduling the dink and dunk guys and making sure that our turnover crews are headed in the right direction, make sure that stuff's going to taken care of in the right manner. Um, we also have a maintenance inspector. So we have a gentleman that goes around, uh, he tours every building on a monthly basis and our owners get a monthly statement to say, hey, listen, I walked around the outside, the gutter was kicked out, I fixed that while I was here. By the way, the stairs are looking a little bit beat up. Maybe we can look at some capbacks to clean up the hallway or maybe a tenant left a whole bunch of junk in the basement. So then I'm gonna go out, I gotta crack skulls and say, hey, listen, we can't have any tenant presence in the basement. You guys need to take care of this. Either use your storage unit or keep it in your unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. On the management side, it's it's lighter touch. So um, I'm the day-to-day -day property manager. Um, we do have two showing agents. So <clears throat> those guys only get to eat what they kill. So if they go out, they're commission-based with a small residual aspect. And I can dive into that, I think is important. And then we also have a virtual assistant in the Philippines who is absolutely phenomenal. Um, she's a huge help. 
What's, what does she do? Um, so she answers phones with tenants, um, but she's like the main point of contact. To, she kind of directs all the interaction. Mm -hmm. um, she's also going to enter bills for owners. So we deal with like a lot of utilities payments for owners. But if you look at the cost, at least from the running the business perspective, um, to have a virtual assistant at $1,100 a month versus for full-time work versus having someone kind of stateside to do that similar work, it allows us to get more leverage on our time and be able to provide the higher quality service for that clients are looking for. Absolutely. Let's talk a little bit about your leasing process. So you have two guys, they eat what they kill. Um, how do they get paid? And, and you mentioned something about a residual. Curious to hear how you, got, how you have that structured. Yep. So this is like one of, the, one of the big sales closes that I work with or that I deliver to prospective clients. So there is no one else in our local area that pays their showing agents residual. It's typically 100% commission. So you get to think about if, if that showing agent's out there and you get an application that, I don't know, maybe meets your criteria by like 70 to 75%, but it's not a slam dunk tenant, they maybe may be more likely to push through that tenant so that they can earn that income that month. Maybe they got to, because they're going to have to put food on the table for the family. And, and I'm glad we're talking about this because that, that is an issue that we face as well too. So, uh, so that's our showing point. people, you know, the, the people that are in charge of doing the leasing only get paid guys typically, not always, but typically if they lease that unit right? So in their best interest to get somebody that is a warm body with a check, a warm body with a check. Somebody through, right. Maybe. And it's, they have terrible all credit, but they make a lot of income. Right. I always, right. And like, it's in we're... our best interest to get somebody that has, quality tenant a warm body with a check but also good credit a and a great, job great job yeah. yeah so that's that's why i'm asking jimmy i'm curious about you know how you guys approach this because this is i think this is a challenge that all property managers face as well as all landlords that hire a property management company to do the leasing for them are Absolutely. also dealing with so the way that we pay our showing agents is they'll get 50 percent of whatever their placement fee is that's number one Number two is if it's a client within an all-inclusive arrangement with us where we handle everything soup to nuts, they're also going to get a residual. So that is a monthly payment for placing a quality tenant. So as long as that tenant stays there and that showing agent is with our team, they get a $5 monthly residual per unit. So I know it's not a lot, but if you're with us for a year, you're going to have the opportunity to place 50 tenants. That's the average of what our showing agents place on an annual basis. So you get an extra 250 bucks a month kind of in perpetuity as long as that tenant stays there or at least an opportunity to place another tenant and have them earn it again um the other big thing is that we guarantee all of our placements for one year that's how much we believe in our process no one else does that so every time we place a tenant it's a one-year lease um so that showing agent is betting that that tenant is going to be there for a year or else if that tenant leaves in six months they've got to place another tenant for free so that really helps us hold our showing agents accountable but also helps us kind of be accountable to our clients as well to place those great long-term paying tenants. Wow. That's that, great. So you guys offer a guarantee. Yeah, that's really interesting because that's one of my challenges with property management. And we have a property manager we use here locally as mm -hmm. well. It's one of my challenges is aligning your goals with your property management company. Again, if you don't, if you're not on the same team, you're not on the same team. Like right. if you guys don't right. have the same goal of, Hey, we want to keep tenants place. Not we want to churn the tenant because we get an extra, uh, 700 bucks every time we, place another tenant. Hate. you know, it's just, it, it's, it's, it's counterproductive to, to a well-balanced portfolio or a well-managed portfolio rather. Mm -hmm. So that's really, so the way that I think about it is I got into real estate investing to produce residual income, right? So you guys got into real estate investing to produce that residual income, a portion of how I earn my management fee, or I would say the way that we earn hundred percent of our management fee is if the tenant pays rent. So step one in terms of us aligning our interest with yours as the investor. Within that management fee, us paying the, the showing agent a portion of that management fee that we earn, that's now aligning their interests in terms of why we got started investing to begin with, with that residual income. So that's the thought process behind how we came up with that. That's great. Well, I love it, man. Yeah, I that's love really it. good. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about some other topics. Uh, let's talk a little bit about house hacking. Um, yeah. how to house hack your way to cash flow freedom, as well as how to house hack and stay married. That's one of the things that you had mentioned that you, you know, had some good insight on. So I'm married. I got a wife. 
how do I go about house hacking and, and her not leaving my ass? Yeah, so we're going to have to wipe that second one because that's changed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the first one, I, I made it through a fair amount of time. So um, house hacking, I think, is the, the best tool to build wealth, at least when you're young. So when I bought my first one, I bought my first four family. I had $70,000 in student loans. And on a 10-year amortization schedule with the interest, it cost me a little over $800 a month. So I was making 50 grand a year when I came out of college, paying $800 a month in student loan interest, the car payment, numerous other things. I was still able to buy a four-unit property. Um, when I came out of college, it was, uh, I graduated in 2010, bought my first multi in 2012. So the market was still kind of in that trough before it started to take off again. I think now we're kind of towards the peak of the cycle. There's still some good cash flow to be found out there. Um, you just got to hunt a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. So I talk about my first deal and I joke that, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky to be, than to be good. So I actually had no idea what I was doing. I had a really great realtor that coached me on what cash flow looked like. And I think I still own one of the ugliest buildings in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. It's hideous on the outside. It's nice on the inside. Um, I'm all in on that building for four units for 150,000. Um, to provide folks perspective in terms of like a lot of the things that I just said, why it's a great wealth building tool. My mortgage payment when I first bought that property was $1,040 a month. I came in, I placed my first tenant. Um, I had two out of four units vacant and the monthly rent on his unit was $900 per month. And that's when the light bulb went off. I said, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm living in one of the units. I'm getting $500 a month on another. And I just placed this guy at 900. I'm already somewhat cash flow positive. Obviously, there's some software expenses that you factor into the profit and loss statement that I'm not thinking about. But I still had one other unit um, to rent out, which I rented out for $1,000 a month. So that's what really started to get the wheels turning of like, hey, this could be a really great wealth building tool. And it's basic arithmetic, right? So if you can add, subtract, uh, divide and multiply, you can buy a multifamily property. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you got a pretty good deal on that property. You yeah, only a thousand dollar mortgage. That's about what hundred and fifty thousand dollar property. Yeah, you rent out you know units for anywhere between five hundred and a thousand bucks. Yeah, that's that's a really good deal. It's a good deal you got there. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah, you got to be like I said. I was lucky in that scenario, but it it really set me up. Um, and I was able to buy a second one. So here's where the burst strategy comes into play. So within one year after. I had stabilized that property. I had an offer from another investor um, from the realtor who sold it to me. He said, hey, listen, I have this client. Um, she just raised $2 million worth of capital from a sale. She sold like condos in South Carolina or something. Um, she'd like to buy your building for $215,000. And I was like, wow, that sounds really cool. So imagine this, like I'm a 24 year old kid. I just, I'm a year into real estate. I really don't know what I'm doing. And damn, you know, around $60,000 sounds really nice before taxes, right? And I, you know, I sat back and I thought about it and I was like, no, you know what? I'm in this game for long-term cash flow." So I went back to the bank and I, I refied out. So when I had come in, I'd come in with a, a product that was similar to FHA that I acquired through a local housing agency. So when I refied, refied out, it put me in non-owner occupied paper. So a non-owner occupied mortgage. And it allowed me to go and buy a second multifamily with three and a half percent down. So I think one of the, one of the key components of a successful real estate investor is getting the proper leverage on your money. Mm -hmm. So you figure I got into that first one for 5% down, got into my second one for three and a half percent down. I have two cash flowing assets um, for less than $15,000 out of my pocket, essentially, mm -hmm. which is just absolutely wild. Um, so as a newer investor, I think that's one of the things that you really want to focus on. It's like, how do I leverage my money up front to use some of these programs in order to give me more momentum when I start buying other multifamily properties. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's, that's awesome, man. So what took you from, you know, buying these multifamilies and house hacking into starting a property management company? Yeah, absolutely. So after I bought my first one, I was really excited about real estate. And I'm thinking, all right, well, what do I do next? So everybody loves to wholesale, right? Everybody and everybody knows how to do it you really sure well. Do. You know that. That's right. <laughs> so um, it took me a while to figure it out. Um, we're back into wholesaling now. We're having success. But in the beginning, I had no idea. 
I was an extreme introvert. So I was a financial analyst for a, a mutual fund company locally um, based out of Boston, Massachusetts. And I didn't really know how to talk to people on the phone because that's not what I did naturally, right? But I was really good at cranking the numbers. So I started sending yellow letters and my phone started to ring and I had still had no idea what I was doing until I heard um, a phone call from a gentleman out of Attleboro, Massachusetts. And he said, hey, listen, I'm going to sell my three family to you. I'm willing to sell it for 150000 I knew I had a deal. Throughout this process, I was mailing multifamily owners with high equity. I was mailing an inherited list and I was mailing a probate list. I've never gotten so many death threats from that uh, inherited list. It was absolutely wild. It made me really second guess what I was doing. Right. Um, but the right owners, I mean, they own those assets free and clear. So those are great seller finance opportunities as well. Um, so it's kind of the good with the bad, right? Like it's really scary getting that death threat over the phone when they won't tell you who the hell it is and you're still going to mail that list. <laughs> and then, you know, you got the other side where there's other people that are so thankful that you're going to help them out of that bad scenario and help them raise capital um, to essentially do what they see fit with the money. So during that process, I'm mailing those three lists and I realized I'm really good at talking to tired landlords. And then I caught a bad review. I had like the absolute worst manager. She was, she was very difficult, just didn't get along with me. And I caught a bad year end review. And I walked back to my cubicle and I text my now partner and I'm like, listen, we're going to launch a property management company. And his text back was, can we grab a beer first? And I was <laughs> like, listen, we're, we're going to get after it. Um, he was working for another local property manager. And the rest is really history from there. But I think the moral of that story is along your real estate investing journey, you're going to find pivot points. So you're going to figure out like what, what works well and what doesn't and try to really chase that opportunity uh, in terms of what works well. So you can focus on what you want to and not what's, you don't always have to focus on the painful things. Real estate investing um, isn't as I was going to say, real estate investing is difficult, but um, you're going to be able to find your niche kind of through failure. And mm -hmm. that's, that's how I got into property management. Hell yeah, man. That's I great, love it, man. I love it. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about um, rehab strategies and let's see here. It says uh, rehab strategies leverage to attract tenants. What do you got on that? Yeah. So one of the big things that we're doing right now, as we talked about this at the beginning of the podcast, but as cap rates kind of came down and we saw where properties were trading in the local market, we found a new opportunity. So this is another like pivot point. So we are naturally geared towards buy and hold opportunities. That's what we really like to do. So we can grow that long-term, have the monthly cash flow, but also have that generate long-term wealth from building the equity in each property. Where properties started trading, we realized there was still a margin there where we could rehab them and flip them. And it was actually below 70% LTV on a lot of the deals like we like to clear. So we think about that 70% rule that a lot of flippers use. The properties that we're taking down more so recently are in that 60 to 65% uh, kind of rule range, right? So mm -hmm. a broader margin um, of money to be made. So what we're doing is we're taking down between two to four unit buildings and immediately we're gonna come in on day one and we're gonna increase rents. So we like to buy buildings that have below market rents. When you come in on day one, you can increase those rents to market. So you're gonna have the rehab budget for those units if the tenants decide to move out. If not, now you have a market rent. So it's gonna be more appealing to an investor coming in the backside. And in that two to four unit range, you're gonna be targeting an owner occupied buyer. Um, hopefully this doesn't sound uh, too terrible, but a lot of times they're, they're not as experienced investors. So they're going to be really psyched on that higher cash flow. And they may not be thinking about that CapEx down the road if that tenant were to move out. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective, that puts them in a better position to qualify for a mortgage. But hey, if I don't have to turn over that unit, that now increases my margin on the backside when I go to sell it as well. Mm -hmm. Right? Because it, it, it really helps that net operating income formula work out. So what we'll do is um, we will hopefully intentionally get a unit vacant and then we'll turn it over and we'll make it really nice. And that'll be our own occupied unit. And then we'll throw it on the market. So an example of that is um, we bought a two family in North Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we finished the rehab last Friday. We had purchased that building for $175,000. It was a $31,000 rehab uh, with holding costs, um, interest on hard money. Uh, we're into it for about 220,000. We listed it at 279 
Uh, within two days of being on the market, we had 28 showings uh, with proper social distancing. Wow. And, uh, a lot of showings, man. Mm -hmm. six, we had six offers um, within four hours of after we wrapped up the showing. Uh, we went into highest and best, and we actually put it under contract for 303000 with five back. Oh, so um, essentially, net to seller of 298, we're into it for 220. And uh, that just goes to show you how hot the market is and, and how we moved into that kind of, we pivoted into the strategy where it, it wasn't something that from a cash flow perspective, we wanted to hold, but you've got that really solid margin to flip these properties. And that's the beautiful thing about real estate guys is there's so many different things you can do with real estate. You can buy for cash flow. You can buy for appreciation. You can buy and fix up and flip. You can buy and stabilize or even get properties to the market rate. You can do lease options, you can do sub twos. I mean, there is a million different things that you can do. You can buy on sub two and sell on lease option. I mean, there's so many different strategies that we can use to make money in real estate. And oh, yeah. here, it sounds like he is you know, using a lot of these strategies. Uh, speaking of another strategy, let's talk a little bit about a 203K loan for a townhouse rehab that, that you had, I guess. You had mentioned yeah. here um, in, our, in our show notes about a 203K. I don't know a lot about a 203K. I know it's a loan that a buyer would get for a property that needs a lot of work, but that's as far as I go on 203K. There's a guy in St. Louis um, and he specializes in these. And if I ever have anything, I go to him, but I, I don't have this very often. So let's, let's explain a little bit about the 203K loan and then explain, uh, you know, what you, how you had used it on one of your townhouses. Definitely. So exactly what you said, I think it's really important that if you're going to tackle a renovation project and use a 203K loan to work with a mortgage broker who sells these products frequently, because if they don't, it is going to be a much tougher process for you. So um, I reached out to my local network and found a mortgage broker that was familiar with these products. There's really two different types of 203K loans. One is a... Streamlined, yeah, yeah. Uh, one is a streamlined 203k, so that would be a project that was $35,000 or less. Um, my and advice that's for the going, rehab budget, the project itself, not the purchase, correct? Yep, so that's so for the rehab. Budget. So, does that mean that they basically just give you all the cash up front and then you it's up to you to manage it? So, they split it 50 50. Perfect. So, you yes. would get 50% up front, like that. yep, and the check's going to be made out, going to be made out to the borrowers on the loan as well as the general contractor. So you all have to, it'll be a double Agreed. or triple endorsement yep. on the back of the check. Anything above 35,000, that goes into, it's not the streamline program, it's a true or two or 3K program. And then you can ask for specific draws, but you have to pay for an FHA inspector to go out to ensure that the work has been completed. Each Within time the, you want the new draw. Right. Right. Now, the other big hurdle that you have to clear is you've got to find a general contractor that wants to work within the two or three K program. Yeah, a lot of contractors, they probably they don't, don't want, want to wait for the money. Paperwork. Yeah. And that extra pain in the butt, they're probably charged a little more to do those, to, to work in those programs. But again, you want to find one that specializes. That's why I mentioned, I know a guy, literally one guy here in town and that's like his niche. He's niched himself into doing the two or three Ks and he does, I follow him on all different social channels. He does awesome work. I love following him because I love seeing the transformations. I mean, some of the transformations yes. that he and his clients are doing are transformations that rehabbers would do to then, you know, to buy, fix, and then flip, but they're buying to fix, to live. So it's a whole different approach, but I really like it because a lot of the ones, not all, but a lot of the ones that they're doing are really historic. You That's know? really cool. And, and, and they're, yeah. And they're, and they're going in and they're putting in, you know, they're putting in more money into the rehabs in some cases than the rehabber would do, right? Because right. it's their, it is their home and they're planning on living there. So I guess what I'm trying to say though, is the transformations that I see him doing, and that's just one guy, but they're really, really neat. And he does a good job with them. So it allows so me, it basically though, to kind of sum up 203K, right? It just allows a buyer to buy a property with a loan that they're gonna live in. So it's a primary residence loan, but it's, yeah. a, it's a loan that includes additional funding to fix up the house, right? Isn't that the yes. biggest high level way to look at it? Absolutely. And they'll actually over lend on the rehab project. So um, they will lend up. So if you buy a house for a hundred thousand to use round numbers, they'll lend on the rehab 5% above after uh, appraised value. 
So if, if you think that that project at a hundred thousand, you're going to be all in for a hundred thousand on the backside, they will lend you up to $105,000. So additional 5,000 above that, that final appraised value. So you can actually over-improve it. Kind of like you were saying on the historic homes, like historic homes are expensive to renovate, particularly if you want to stay true to the time period. Um, so I think it's an amazing program um, to live in, truly live in the house of your dreams. If you want to go through the process. I love it, man. So did you use one of these loans? I did. So it was a townhouse conversion. So it was really cool. Um, it was in the city, uh, town of Lincoln, Rhode Island. And um, it was four units. The house was built in 1880. The third floor was eight bedrooms. So basically, old day Rhode Island, <clears throat> you would build a really nice mansion, like close to the center of town to kind of show off because you didn't have to bring your horse, horse and buggy into town, you could just walk. So this was one of those houses where the eight bedrooms up top were actually servants quarters and they still have like all the racks upstairs for drying your clothes. It was like really, it was interesting to see. So <clears throat> when I went through there, it was four one bedroom units, but one of the units was gutted to the drywall essentially. It had um, rough plumbing and rough electrical done. And then they gutted the entire third floor. So they got rid of all that horsehair plaster, which is absolutely miserable to deal with. I don't know if, they have that where you guys are at, but it's super heavy and super expensive to get rid of. Mm. So I'm kind of seeing this blank slate. <clears throat> and um, I told my realtor, I said, Hey, listen, this, this is going to be the building we, we can negotiate down on, um, which we were able to successfully do. But then also we can turn this into a townhouse style unit, which is going to get me much higher rent on the backside. Mm. Originally when I was kind of thinking about it, I'd say, I thought, Hey, I'll rehab the one bedroom. And I'll keep it as a one bedroom until I went to that second floor. I'm like, no, let, let's see if we can make this happen. And we were. How many units um, did you turn it into? Uh, so it, it, it was a four unit building <clears throat> and I just kept it four units because there was no second point of egress from that third floor. And to get that was gonna be super expensive. So what came into play there, and this is something that investors are, should pay attention to is uh, fire code. Mm -hmm. So that building, I actually had to do uh, a fire rate of wall in between essentially each half of the building. So I had to use upgraded drywall to increase the burn time to pr protect the tenants on either side of the building if in case of any type of fire. Mm -hmm. um, we also had to upgrade the, the entrance doors to be specifically like longer time uh, fire rated doors. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the things that we really had to pay attention to as we went through this 203K project. Um, but essentially, you know, I'm all into that building for 220,000 and the gross rent roll on a monthly basis is uh, $3,800. Wow. With, awesome. with <clears throat> so just, I just throw out numbers to provide perspective. Um, but that's really like another home run deal. Um, and for my second deal is pretty solid. Hell yeah. How, um, how long does the two or three K process take from start to finish? Yeah. So it's going to depend on, it's all going to depend on your reno. So, um, we actually had some issues with contractors, particularly plumbing contractors. We thought we had a really solid one and we went through like three or four <laughs> before we finished the project. Um, but it could be as short as 30 days. Um, mine was seven months just because it, the rehab took a lot longer in terms of getting the right contractors out there and completing the project. Yeah. And then having um, your inspectors come by, come through on the back end and approve everything and whatnot. Absolutely. Seven months isn't terrible though for, for that type of a project. I mean, you're getting a loan for the purchase and the rehab. Then you have to follow certain guidelines. You have to have inspectors come through to make sure those guidelines are done and executed the right way. You know, that's really not that crazy of a time frame, in my opinion. I mean, no, it's of, pretty good. Some and, of our and, rehab flips take four or five months, and we don't even have two or three Ks yep. or inspectors right. or permit yeah. or any of the above. Well, or full time. And Jimmy, you said this was your second project, right? So, I mean, I imagine yeah. you're still working the day job, too, right? Yeah. So, yep. I mean, again, that's great to uh, be able to do a four unit flip like that. Totally agree. Yeah, it's awesome, man. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let's talk about, let's, uh, we got a couple more minutes here before we wrap up, but let's talk about that time that you almost walked away from a deal for $1,000. So that was, that was my first deal. Right. And that was when I didn't fully understand cash flow. So I've got that. It was a short sale and I was extremely frustrated with the short sale process because we know short sales are very, very long or can be. Um, so my first short sale deal, there was a short sale negotiator in place, which helps out. And they did have an agreed upon price, um, but it still took the bank seven months to approve it or six months. Wow. And then it took us 30 days to close from there, um, which I heard that that's not always the case. If you've got all the pieces in line, it should go much more quickly. Um, but maybe there was just. should though. I mean, who knows? Sometimes the bank <laughs> just take their time, you know? Right. Right. So where did the so, 1000 come into play? 
we went through we went through the home inspection and uh the only big thing that came out of the home inspection was the, the electrical line in on the outside of the building and uh the total cost was going to be a thousand dollars and i told my realtor i'm like well if they're not going to fix that then i'm out <laughs> he's like whoa 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 he's like you realize how good of a deal this is when you get it up and running it's going to be like ten thousand dollars worth of capex once you get in um and then this is just a thousand bucks here and this is going to be like a lot so for perspective i just got it appraised and that building appraised at three hundred thirty thousand. i'm into it for 150 and i almost walked away over that thousand dollar electrical line in just like yeah, let that be a lesson to you right the Some stuff that we know now costs in the beginning aren't a big deal at all well and i would i would go further and say it's that emotion because uh jimmy you were saying that you were just so fed up with that short sale process that this right. little thing was going to set just you over one the more edge. thing right that, that's yeah. the straw that so breaks you, the camel you've got to get that emotion out of it and just remember those numbers which is what you did which is great that's it yeah i'm glad my realtor had to come to jesus talk with me and i'm like all right i got you Good. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh we'll still clear this one so Guys, if you are an investor in the Rhode Island area, you got to check out Jimmy. He is the um, owner and he runs the Lion Property Management Group. Am I saying that right, Jimmy? Yep. And, uh, Lion it, Property Management Group. Jimmy, where can people find you online? Uh, do you guys have a property management website or where would somebody go to inquire and get more information about you and or your property management, assuming that they're already in the, the, the Rhode Island area, or maybe you're listening to this podcast and you're in Phoenix or you're in New Jersey or you're in you know, Tampa and you're interested in, in doing some investing in Rhode Island. Where can somebody go and they find more information about you? Two ways. So one would be to check out our website. It's lionpropertygroup.com and it's L-Y-O-N. Uh, the Lion other way is propertygroup.com, L Y O N. And then the, the other way is uh, via Instagram. If you want to give me a follow on Instagram, um, I also run a podcast with a partner, and uh, the handle is The Cash Flow Kings. The Cash Flow. I like the name. The Cash Flow Kings. That's the IG handle. Absolutely. Awesome. And then what's the podcast name? Same thing? Same thing. Got it. All right. Cool, guys. Check him out. The Cash Flow Kings podcast, the Cash Flow Kings on Instagram, or you can go direct at lionpropertygroup.com. Get more information about Jimmy and his property management company. And I'm eager to check out your podcast, Jimmy. That sounds awesome. Um, awesome. Any parting words for our listeners and our viewers today? Yeah, just keep waking up every day, taking action, trying to learn new things, and you will right. be successful for a very long time in this business. Just keep plugging away, guys. Consistent, persistent action. Mike knows that that's one of my favorite quotes, and that's really the key to success, in my opinion, in anything you do. Just consistent, persistent action. Just keep putting one foot in front of the other. You don't have to be a, a sprinter in this business. This is, a, you know, especially when you're dealing with property you know, landlord property management, you know, this is a long-term game. This is a marathon, not a sprint. So just keep one foot in front of the other guys. Don't forget you make your money. When you buy, you get paid when you sell. That's, That's right. right. Jimmy, thank you so much for coming on. All right, Thanks guys, me, we are signing off until next time. We'll see you then. <laughs>